We'll take your Bibles and turn to Mark chapter 6. Mark chapter 6. This morning we come to a text that is one of the most familiar stories in all the New Testament. As we'll note, it's the only miracle Jesus performed that's recorded in all four Gospels. And it shows and highlights for us the sympathetic and the sufficient shepherd, the Lord Jesus. It's very familiar, but I think we want to read it with fresh ears and fresh hearts. Let me put that in our minds and we'll go back and walk through the text together. Mark chapter 6, beginning in verse 30. Mark 6, 30. The apostles gathered together with Jesus and they reported to him all that they had done and taught. And he said to them, come away by yourselves to a secluded place and rest for a while. For there were many people coming and going and they did not even have time to eat. They went away in the boat to a secluded place by themselves. And the people saw them going. And many recognized them and ran there together on foot from all the villages or cities and got there ahead of them. When Jesus went ashore, he saw a large crowd. And he felt compassion for them because they were like sheep Sheep without a shepherd. He began to teach them many things. And it was already quite, when it was already quite late, his disciples came to him and said, "Uh, this place is desolate and it's already quite late. Send them away so they may go into the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. But he answered them, you give them something to eat. They said to him, shall we go and spend 200 denarii on bread and give them something to eat? And he said to them, how many loaves do you have? Go look. And when they found out, they said, five and two fish. He commanded them all to sit down by groups on the green grass. And they sat down in groups of hundreds and of fifties. He took the five loaves and the two fish and looking up toward heaven, he blessed the food and broke the loaves and kept giving them to the disciples to set before them. And he divided up the two fish among them all. They all ate and were satisfied. They picked up 12 full baskets of the broken pieces and also of the fish. There were 5,000 men who ate those loaves. One of the things that we take for granted in our culture is food. The abundance of food, the convenience of food in America is staggering. Think how easy it is to obtain food. There are grocery stores and supermarkets. There's Costco and Sam's Club. Convenience stores everywhere. Even when we travel from one place to another and we get on the freeway, we don't go many exits without finding a a Flying J, a Quick Trip, a Loves, a 7-Eleven, a Stop and Go, and on and on and on and always Stuckies, right? If you have the means to pay for it, which is another lesson, If you have the means to pay for it, finding food is not hard. It's almost anywhere. It's almost everywhere. Food in our day is not only convenient, it is abundant. I read this week that Americans typically waste about a pound of food a day per person. That's on average. And get this. (laughs) Those of you with the healthiest diets waste the most food. Vegetables, more vegetables and fruit are wasted than any other food commodity. About 150,000 tons of food is tossed out in the U.S. each day, which is the equivalent of to about a third of our calories that we need. Americans don't really understand 
the problem of food not being convenient. The point is this, few people have to plan their day around eating. You can run down to the store just from about anywhere you are, run down to a restaurant, find something to eat very quickly and very easily. Story that we're looking at this morning is quite the opposite. It describes a completely counterintuitive idea of food than you and I typically have to face. Now, in the time of Jesus, food was not convenient. There were no open-air markets outside the villages, no fast food chains along the roads. Once outside the villages, you were on your own. You had to bring your own lunch or dinner or breakfast until the next village. In the scene that we look at in Mark 6, we're way outside the village. There are a couple of villages in the surrounding area where We'll just talk about Bethsaida where they are uh, camped out to, to have this, this miracle seen by the Lord. But they're away from the villages. They can't just go across the street to, the, to McDonald's. And the context of that is really significant for our narrative. This is a unique and special account. It's a miracle of our Lord performed that's recorded, as I said, in all four Gospels. It's the only miracle in all four Gospels, we could say, except for the resurrection. This is the only one performed at Jesus' hands in front of people. And all four, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all four have their own unique detail additions to this story. The underlying lesson is pretty simple. This is the one that we teach in children's church and in the children's program in our curriculum on purpose and for good reason. It's to know and be persuaded by the attributes of Jesus, what he's like, who he is. Mark tells us that he was a shepherd looking at sheep. And Mark presents him as a sympathetic and a a, uh, sufficient shepherd. So let's break this passage down, just walk through it. I think this is just a very simple story to tell and to be implicated by. Three persuading attributes of Jesus the shepherd we'll note together. Three persuading, I think that's the intent of Mark and the others using this, this story, persuading attributes, characteristics of Jesus the shepherd. The first is in verses 30 to 32. He demonstrated responsive awareness. Responsive awareness. Verse 30. The apostles gathered together with Jesus and they reported to him all that they had done and all that they had taught. Look back to chapter six, verse 13 for a minute. This is the conclusion of him sending them out in verse 13 of chapter six. We find out, They were casting out many demons, anointing with oil many sick people, and healing them. Now stop right there. They were doing this just like Jesus had done. John even tells us that they raised the dead. And then they come back after their first missionary journey. Can you imagine that share time? Peter, you're not going to believe. There was this woman with leprosy. James, there was this man dead and I touched him. You can only imagine those stories. Well, they weren't the only ones who knew about these stories. Obviously, they had healed, cast out demons, raised the dead. Jesus wants to secure some time away from them, which he won't get until in Caesarea Philippi, but he wants to march his way toward a secluded place. Let's have a debrief session. Let's have a retreat. That's what he's asking. Let's get away and have a retreat. Why did he want to get away, have a retreat, debrief on their preaching and their teaching and their miracle performing? Why did he want to do that? The text tells us, for there were many people coming and going and they did not even have time to eat. The people coming and going weren't the ones who didn't have time to eat. It's the disciples who were sharing this. People were coming and saying, he healed me. I want to, and by the way, here's my sick daughter. And they were bombarding not only Jesus, but now the 13 of them coming and going. And so Jesus says, listen, we need to get away and talk about this. 
They've been teaching the message of Jesus and they had been teaching the message about Jesus. Now people are not only interested in getting close to Jesus, now they're interested in getting close to the 12. It was frantic. So much so they couldn't even eat. You know, those of us who have been around ministry, sometimes you, you know that ministry days can be like that. There are some days you go time to time to ministry to ministry to person to person to situation to situation and you get late in the afternoon and you remember that you didn't eat. That's what had happened here. So busy that they just didn't even have time to sit down for a meal. Now here's where Jesus shows a shepherding care, an awareness of these men to get away and let them rest. And no doubt he could have used the rest as well. Remember, he ministered so so intently that they were going a couple of chapters ago across a lake in a storm that was throwing, filling the boat with water and he just kept sleeping. That's how tired ministry was affecting the Savior. He had awareness that they needed rest, they needed a retreat, they needed a debrief. And so he wanted to continue training them and saying, well, let's, let's talk about what you taught. Let's, let's have sermon evaluation. Let's, let's, what did you heal and what did God do through you? So, verse 32, they went away in the boat to a secluded place by themselves. You could actually translate that a private place where they wanted to be by themselves because as we'll see in the next verses, they didn't end up being just by themselves. Secluded means a deserted place. Some translations call it a desert. It, it, it wasn't a desert. It was very plentiful. There were, there were uh, um, uh, crops planted all over that region in Bethsaida. It was merely a place where there was no village. And you know that's important because he's gonna send them to the villages or they're gonna ask to be sent to the villages to find food. He went to a place where there was supposed to be, drum roll, no one. Now as we look at the Savior here, it's persuading, compelling this attribute that he has of being aware of the disciples' needs. Can you just pause for a second? The implication of that for that on you and me is profound. Jesus has a divine awareness, a humanly perfect awareness, a selfless awareness, where then, and listen, I think now, he is always aware of our deepest and most pressing needs. He knows and he cares. He still does. I love that he responded. He was aware and did something about it. It's one thing to know there's a need. It's something else to do something about it. He responded to his awareness that they needed to rest by saying, let's get in the boat and let's go somewhere. Let's have a retreat. Which brings us to a second persuading attribute of Jesus, the shepherd. Not only did he demonstrate responsive awareness, secondly, active compassion. Active compassion. Both of those words are very important. Verse 33, the people saw them going. That's code for they got in a boat and there wasn't a boat for me, so I need to find a way to get up to where they're going. As they were going along the shore, they were not far enough from the shore where they couldn't be recognized. People were recognizing them and running together on foot from all the cities and got there ahead of him. Now, if you can remember uh, the Sea of Galilee, the Galilean Lake, it's kind of like an a, a elongated oval. They were going from Capernaum over to Bethsaida, just across to the northeastern shore, where in this area was, um, were, were, were fields and, and crops and no villages. It was four miles by boat from Capernaum to Bethsaida. It was about eight or 10 miles, depending on the two roads that went that way. If you went along the lands, they probably went the 10 mile route, which was up and down and, and not a straight line, close to the shore so they could keep an eye on this boat, this flotilla that was containing only Jesus and his disciples because apparently there was no boats to chase them with. It was a flotilla of one. So the 12 and Jesus get in this boat to go from Capernaum, the four mile straight line over to the northeast corner of the lake. Now, it had to be clear day that day. 
you could see that the, this was not the day of the storm. The lake was clear, the wind was right, and they were sailing along and you could clearly see just a few hundred yards because they recognized offshore this boat sailing along, tacking along toward the northeastern shore. People were running along trying to keep up with the boat. Four miles by boat, closer to 10 by foot. Now, this, it says that the crowd got there ahead of him. That doesn't mean that the entire 5,000 plus arrived there ahead of him. I think there were probably some, some people who were running, some, some younger guys who probably went there ahead of him. There were no doubt, as we find out in a minute from Matthew, women and children that were there, likely elderly who were there who could not have run. Some got there ahead of him. Why is it important? Verse 34, when Jesus went ashore, he saw what? A large crowd. Remember what this is supposed to be. This is the getaway retreat by ourselves, going to a place where there is no village. Now, if that had been me planning a pastoral retreat, wanting to go to a retreat center where I had been told, it's just gonna be you and the guys. And I get there and it's completely overbooked and full my first response wouldn't have been ministry opportunity. Probably I would have had Bob right with me saying, we have a contract, it's signed, kick these people out, put us in. This is the godly response. No. He saw the large crowd, listen, and he felt compassion for them. Why? Because he noticed they... They were like sheep and they didn't have a shepherd. He began to teach them many things. You know, we skip over this teaching phrase and go straight to the feeding part. Don't miss the fact that his first response to shepherd the lost sheep of Israel was to continue his preaching, teaching ministry. He taught them. Oh, they needed time to rest and they would find it up in Caesarea Philippi not long from now. Tired from ministry, deeply, deeply weary of soul and body. But listen, Jesus' ministry was never, listen, his ministry was never ever deterred by weariness. That's the same for you and me if we wanna follow in his footsteps. How many times have you sat down to dinner and got a phone call of someone who really needed to talk? or early in the morning, or late at night, or when it's not convenient, or you're watching your favorite football team and someone really needs to talk to you, someone has a deep need, do you feel compassion as the Savior? Because he felt it toward them and feels it toward us. He's the shepherd of Israel. So Jesus lands on the shore, immediately met by a large crowd. He and the disciples no doubt has seen these people chasing them along the land as they sailed. Can you imagine? Well, I don't think it's gonna be as quiet as we thought it was gonna be, guys. And instead of saying, sorry, day off, retreat time, come back Monday, he responds. As I said, Luke chapter nine, verse 10 says this was the region of Bethsaida. Eastern bank of the Jordan River. The Jordan River drops down into the lake, Galilean Lake, the Sea of Galilee, and they would have to cross that river to go across to the eastern shore where this area of seclusion would have been. John 6, 2 tells us that the chasing crowd was motivated by the signs they saw him perform. They were coming to see a miracle. And instead of responding like I think I might be tempted to. He felt compassion for them as a shepherd who sees lost sheep. Now, very important, would you take your, your Bibles and flip back over to Ezekiel for a minute. Ezekiel chapter 34. I think this is important because this is an actual fulfillment of what's promised in this chapter. Ezekiel 34, one of the most surprising um, texts in all of the Old Testament, maybe in all of Scripture. Ezekiel 34. 
Then the word of the Lord came to me, Ezekiel says, saying, now what comes next would have been utterly unexpected. Son of man, prophesy against, now if you rewind the tape, against uh, the nation, against um, uh, uh, the sinners, against the wicked, against those who are persecuting Israel. Here it says, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. The prophet was called to prophesy against and confront the shepherds of Israel, the spiritual leaders. Prophesy and say to those shepherds, thus says the Lord God, woe, shepherds of Israel who have been feeding themselves. Should not the shepherds feed the flock? You eat the fat and clothe yourselves with the wool. You slaughter the fat sheep without feeding the flock. Those who are sickly, you've not strengthened. The diseased, you've not healed. The broken, you've not bound up. The scattered, you've not brought back, nor have you sought for the lost. But with force, And with severity, you've dominated them. They were scattered for lack of a shepherd. They became food for every beast of the field and were scattered. Then God says, my flock, wow, my flock. God says, my flock. Wandered through all the mountains on every high hill. My flock was scattered over all the surface of the earth. There was no one to search for them, no one to seek them. Therefore, you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. As I live, declares the Lord, surely because my flock has become prey, my flock has even become food for all the beasts of the field for lack of a shepherd. And my shepherds did not search for my flock, but rather the shepherds fed themselves and did not feed my flock. Therefore, you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. Behold, I am against the shepherds. That's fingernails on the chalkboard. God is against the pastors, the shepherds. I will demand my sheep from them and make them cease from feeding the sheep so the shepherds will not feed themselves anymore, but I will deliver my flock from their mouth. God will deliver the people of Israel from the bad shepherds, which would have been Pharisees and scribes and lawyers and Sadducees, so they will not be food for them. Then, verse 11. And I won't take the time to read the entire rest of the chapter, but please do. He basically says, I myself, verse 11, will search for my sheep and seek them out. In Mark 6, you see the fulfillment of that promise. Back to Mark 6. He looked at them as sheep without a shepherd. He had compassion on them. So he begins to teach them. He immediately and actively shifts into ministry mode. His compassion was active. So he didn't tell them to go visit their rabbi. He taught them himself. But no one expected what's about to happen next, which is really the climax of the story. Mark includes this, so does John and Matthew, and and, um, uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we'll say it that way. They include this to persuade us. Look at what Jesus is like. Isn't he compelling to know, follow, and trust? He has responsive awareness. He has active compassion. And now number three, he has supernatural power. Supernatural, think about that word, supernatural, something beyond nature. Now, as we said, in Bible times, food and water, basic sustenance was not only a major challenge to obtain, but obtaining nutrition and hydration plays an ongoing role in Old Testament narratives. How many times do we see God entering in where there's a famine, no no food, right? Right? In Exodus Exodus chapter 16, you can turn there sometime and read that. God provides for those in the wilderness journey, the wilderness wanderings. They they, they ran out of food. They were literally out in the desert. No food, no water. He actually gives, gives them bread. It rains bread from heaven called what? Manna, good. Rains manna, rains bread from heaven. They complain about that. He gives them quail in the evening. He gives them 
bread and meat, and then he gives them water from a rock. Don't miss this. The Jews of Jesus' time understood that when there was a problem with hydration and nutrition, God had in the Old Testament supernaturally delivered on that need. And if Jesus was going to demonstrate that he was God, this would be a significant point to prove in doing the same. I think it's interesting, by the way, in 2 Kings chapter 4, you can just listen. 2 Kings 4, 42 to 44. Now a man came from Baal, Shalisha, and he brought the man of God bread of the first fruits, 20 loaves of barley, fresh ears of grain in the sack. And he said to them, give to the people so that they may eat. This is Elisha, obviously. His attendant said, what? Will I set before a hundred men? Can I set what you have in one meal before a hundred men? <laughs> but Elisha said, give them to the people so they may eat. For thus says the Lord, they shall eat and have some left over. So set it before them, they ate and had some left over over according to the word of the Lord. Now, these were smart Jewish people who were regular in a synagogue who knew this story. And what they're about to see is a greater triumphant recasting of the same provision of God. Very familiar narrative to the Jews. They knew that God, Yahweh, was sufficient, kind. He was the provider. He was the one who, get this, could create and multiply food. He created it here. Remember when he, in 2 Kings chapter 4, when he uh, pulls the widow in with her sons and there's the creation of that olive oil. Olive oil is a carbon-based organic substance and they cre he created it. They filled up all the, the jars that they had borrowed to pay off their debts. God has proven that he can create and multiply and manipulate and control his natural world. By the way, this multiplication and this creation, both are about to take place. Verse 35. When it was already quite late, that's another, it's a euphemism for saying it's getting sunset, sundown. His disciples came to him and said, this place is desolate. By the way, the fact that he's can, they've gone until sundown indicates probably the length of his sermon. Just want to say that. <laughs> Sun is setting. They say, Lord, this place is desolate. It's already quite late. Send them away so they may go into the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. They had run to chase after the Savior. They hadn't even stopped to get provisions, stopped to pack a lunch. They wanted to get to Jesus. Food was secondary. What a lesson there is there. So attracted to Christ that food becomes secondary. That's genuine fasting, by the way. Lord, send them away. They're gonna get hungry. We're the leaders of this show and they're gonna expect us to provide. But, verse 37, he answered them, you <laughs> give them something to eat. Now stop right there. Why is that important? They had just given the report and were going to give another report of what they could do in his name. So he's basically saying, you take care of it. Another way of saying that is you've demonstrated supernatural abilities by proxy. I've given you these. Feed them. Ah, oh, the disciples. Instead of saying, yeah, we have been given power by you. Maybe we could do something. They say, shall we... Spend 200 denarii, which would not have been enough to feed that many people, by the way, on bread and give them something to eat. They're just thinking pure logistical 
pure, natural, purely on this world. We don't have enough money to pay for them. It's almost, all four um, writers tell us this happens. So it's almost like they're making the point. Jesus said, you feed them. And they said, well, I mean, I guess we could if we had enough money. After having just had this session over um, across the lake in Capernaum about all that they had been doing in his name. Pretty interesting. Jesus takes control in verse 38. And he said to them, how many loaves do you have? They didn't know, so he says, go look. And when they found out, they said, five loaves and two fish. Okay, Um, kids, kids, where did they get these loaves and these fish? If if you're an adult and you say so, we're gonna put you in the nursery, so don't answer. Kids, where do they get these loaves and fish? Where do they get them? From a kid, exactly right, exactly right. Now, what's interesting about this is that we don't find that out in this narrative. Matthew tells us, John tells us rather, but not Matthew, not not Mark. Which is interesting, of the four accounts, only one tells us that these resources came from a little boy. Is that important? Sure it is. He gave up his lunch, but as we'll find out in a minute, he got more than he gave He's completely satisfied. And I only bring that up to say that I love the fact that we emphasize that in our flannel graphs and our children's program, but it's not the main point. I remember, I remember as a kid, this, this kid, I wanna be like this boy. I wanna give Jesus my lunch. What a sweet attitude. That's fantastic. It's just not the point of this text. We have five loaves and two fish. So Jesus becomes the great logistics coordinator. He commanded them all to sit by groups on the green grass. And they sat down in groups of hundreds and of fifties. Now to get a better feel for what's happening here, you have to look down to verse 44, okay? There were 5,000 men here. Now you say, this is the feeding of the 5,000. You would be wrong. The heading in your Bible that says the feeding of the 5,000 is not accurate. How do I know that? Because Matthew 14, 21 says there were 5,000 men besides the women and children. Now, put that number in perspective. If most of them had a wife and most of them had one child, that would be 15,000. Conservatively, this would have been the feeding of the somewhere between 15 and 20,000. For some perspective, I did a little research the average attendance for NBA basketball games last year was 17,987, about 18,000. So imagine going in to an NBA venue with all of these people and having to feed them with a lunch. By the way, people say, well, how did they know how many people were there? How could they count? He divided them into these these groups and could say, well, there's 100, there's 50, there's 100, there's 50. It's easy to add up at that moment. Verse 41, he took the fish, the five loaves and the two fish. And as I said, only John, John 6, 9 tells us that it was the little boy who gave up his lunch for this and good for that little boy. Looking up toward heaven, he blessed the food. And I I need to introduce you to an important Greek tense. Um, uh, Sometimes sometimes the Greek matters. This is a time where it does. Uh, It's an imperfect tense, which means something that's done with an ongoing fashion. It's not something you do once and and you're done. And, And so if you were to translate this, He blessed the food and was in the process of breaking it over and over and kept giving it over and over to them for the disciples to set before them. And he kept dividing over and over up the two fish among them all. Here's the point. The multiplication and the creation of that food happened in the hands of Jesus. Now, could he have just waved his hands over these baskets? Absolutely. But the text tends to give us every indication that he was breaking and it was growing back. Breaking and it was growing back. He couldn't, 
He couldn't exhaust the food he was breaking apart. Kept breaking. That involved multiplication and creation, just like God in Exodus with the manna and the quail and the water, and just like God in 2 Kings. And verse 44 is really important. And they all ate and were satisfied. That's, that's such a sweet, sterilized way to translate that. Here's the better way to translate. They all ate and they were stuffed beyond everything. You know what it's like to be so full? You know like Thanksgiving after your third meal of the leftovers and you just feel like I, I can't eat anything else. That's the feeling they had. They didn't have just some food. They were satisfied with their food. They were completely filled up. And I think about the speed with which Jesus must have done this. The speed of him breaking the bread and breaking the fish and breaking the bread and breaking the fish to feed 20,000 people. Imagine how, how amazing that was. They were no longer hungry. They were full, they were stuffed, they were satisfied. And verse 43 they picked up 12 full baskets of the broken pieces and also of the fish. Why is that significant? How many men were passing out these baskets? Jesus took care of his men as well. You know what I find interesting? That it's not 13. Where did Jesus get his food? We can only speculate fish and the bread was left over just like in 2 Kings. And there were 5,000 men and also women and children. Now I've tried really hard, as you know, and I, I wanna confess, one of the difficulties in preaching through a gospel is to preach the text that's before us and not the event that's recorded in other places. That, that's the challenge every week I have. But sometimes I think it's important for some perspective to, to borrow some perspective from one of the other gospel writers. John tells us that the people knew what had happened. Somehow, some or most of them had watched him break a piece of bread, give half of it away, and it was equally the same size when he, go, when he went to break it again. They'd seen this happen. Verse chapter, John chapter six, verse 14 says, therefore when, the, therefore, when the people saw the sign which he had performed, they said, this is truly the prophet who has come into the world. So Jesus perceiving that they were intending to come, take him by force and make him a king, withdrew again to the mountain by himself alone. Remember how we see this um, over and over in Mark, this, this command to silence. He raises a man's daughter from the dead and says, don't tell anybody. He heals a man from leprosy and says, shh, don't tell anybody. Why? He hadn't died and risen from the grave yet. It wasn't the complete message as is demonstrated here. They, they wanted to make him king right then. Can you imagine someone running for political office today who says, anything that's wrong with you, come and I'll touch you and I'll fix and anyone who's hungry and who lacks uh, sustenance, come and I'll feed you. Would you vote for that man for king or Messiah? Of course. On the scale of it, this was Jesus' biggest and most extensive miracle. I think we're fair to say close to 20,000 people were a part of this miracle. And it was done to show him as a shepherd with a shepherd's heart for the lost sheep of Israel as the fulfillment of Ezekiel 34 who would be the shepherd to come and take care of his sheep. Not only physically in the miracle, but what did he do up until sundown? He, he taught them. He was taking care of them spiritually with their souls. But they saw him only as a welfare provider, not a sovereign savior. Can we just slide over for a second and look at our hearts? How easy is it for us to look to Jesus as a spiritual short order cook? 
just show up and say, I need, I need, I want, I want, and can you fulfill this order? And if not, I'll ask you again tomorrow. We should take every need, every desire to Jesus, have it purified and have his, uh, our dependence on him for those things. That's absolutely appropriate. Whatever gives us anxiety, Philippians 4, take it to him in prayer. But if we're only looking to the Lord, only looking to Jesus for the utilitarian praxis of what he can give us and do for us and not how we can provide him the honor and the worship that he deserves because of who he is, if we haven't been compelled and persuaded by his attributes to worship, then we will be tempted to be persuaded and compelled to use him to meet our needs. It's a fine line there. Of course we take our needs to him. Of course we take our desires and wants to him. But when we only want him for what he can do for us, instead of coming to him because of who he is, we've missed the point of worship. That's what happened here. John tells us. They wanted to make him king. Think of what he could do for a nation as king with those kind of skills and powers. Power, authority, ownership of the natural world, compassion, awareness. Boy, do we still trust and believe in that Savior who, listen, is alive and the same today as he ever was? He knows your needs, he knows your wants, he knows your checkbook, he knows your credit cards, he knows your relational problems that you're experiencing with people. He knows your, your criticisms that you have of others and he knows of those who criticize you and he cares. What a savior. Mark gives us this whole story so that we can see it and back up and say, this is the shepherd. This is the shepherd who said, the shepherds of Israel were not taking care of my people. I will come and do it. And in Jesus, he did, listen, and he is the great shepherd of the lost sheep. He's only the shepherd of those of us who know him as our shepherd, our Lord, our savior. I just wanna invite you and compel you that this text shows you what kind of savior you can run to to be saved from sin, to avoid eternal judgment. Because the power of the Holy Spirit can turn on your awareness to see that he is who he, he claims to be and does what the text claims he did and offers you eternal life and forgiveness of sin and hope for heaven and freedom from judgment. If that's something that you're interested in, I, I wanna beg you, not ask you, I wanna beg you, do not leave this building, please. I'd love to talk to you. Any of the pastors would, the people around you would love to talk to you and just say, you know what? I need to talk about my soul and my heart. You will find ready people to talk to you about that. 